Um, some, for, for me at least, maybe it, won't, maybe it won't touch anybody's hearts but mine, but it, it really hit mine this week. And even this morning, early this morning in the office here, as I went over the message one more time, um, shed some more tears there. So, thank you. We're picking up. Of course, uh, the last time I only made it two verses. Um, we're, so we're picking up at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, and I'm going to read verses 3 and 4 to start with here. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 say, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So we had seen in verse 2, and of course I still have my shirt up here, preach the word shirt, but I, I will be taking it down now. But we saw in verse 2 that the word is to be preached to confront people, to convince people, to convict people, to correct people who are holding wrong doctrine, who are holding wrong beliefs, who are sinning. We also saw that in verse 2 that the word is to be preached to, to rebuke. It's to be preached to reprimand and warn with the threat of consequences. The word is to be preached, uh, preached to, to express strong disapproval. The word is to be preached to, to criticize sternly with the, with the possible threat of punishment. The word is to be preached to point out sin and to call sin what it is. And to tell those who commit it that they are wrong and to call them to repent of their sin. And we saw that the Word is to be preached to come alongside of people to encourage them to live righteously in their lives and correct their sinful be beliefs and behaviors. But then we get to verses 3 and 4, and when the Word is preached in this way, what's still a big problem? It's not a rhetorical question. What's still a big problem according to what we read here in verses 3 and 4? People don't want to hear it. They certainly don't want to obey it. Even when you do preach it. That's what verses 3 and 4 are talking about here. People with itching ears want teachers and preachers to tell them what they want to hear rather than confront them with the truth of the Word of God. The focus here on these verses is on those who hear the Word. Who hear the Word preached, but have a tendency to go where they can hear preaching and teaching that they can live with, instead of preaching and teaching that they can live by. Many folks want preaching and teaching that fits their lifestyle, instead of preaching and teaching that changes and guides their lifestyle, the way they live. Many folks want to hear preaching and teaching that lines up with what they've already decided is truth, honestly. Many people seek to find preachers who are going to say stuff that lines up with what those people have already made up in their mind is what they believe truth in the world is, and it is often not what they've made up their mind on often has not been the Word of God. Real truth is only of God. We need to understand that. Real truth is only of God. And it can only be obeyed or disobeyed. There isn't anywhere in between. There's not a gray area when it comes to truth as defined by God. Truth often demands change in life. Truth demands, the Word of God demands that we change the way we live and the way we think even. And truth often even demands that we make sacrifices in life. It's the reality. Confrontation with the truth therefore often produces discomfort in us. <laughs> and I am no different. I assure you. And it often produces discomfort especially for people who just are not willing to submit to the authority of the Word of God. And I've come across a lot of church-going people that will just outright say, oh, I'm not going to do that. 
Again, this is why people have always tended to surround themselves with preachers and teachers who say what the people want them to say. Would you be surprised to know, now this, this I, I'm glad this has happened a while ago, quite a while ago, but would you be surprised to know that as the pastor of this church, I have been told things like, it is, no, it is none of your business how I live my life. And my spiritual life is between me and God. I don't have to answer to you. This has all been because I challenged folks out of the Word of God. Now again, I praise God that that hasn't happened for a while. So that's good. But that is the position that a lot of people take. Isaiah 30 verses 9 through 11 says about the Israelites of those days, quote, These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. They say to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions for us. Leave this way. Get off this path. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. End quote. Nothing has changed. People still like to hear only pleasant things. Positive and encouraging things. Only teachings that correspond to their desires. This then allows them to continue to do what they want to do. How they want to live. People don't even like to hear that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And this again includes church-going people. And pastors who will not acknowledge that there is no other way to heaven but Jesus. They will say things like, well, devoted people to other faiths, I think, you know, there's this multi multiple paths to God thing. That is contrary to the Word of God. Any of us, then, too, is susceptible to getting offended because we get our toes tramped on, right? And believe me, I'm the first one that gets the toe tramping when I'm studying through the Word of God to, to prepare these messages. All of us will not like some things that we hear from the Word of God. Warren Wiersbe, theologian, wrote this, It is not likely that man-made fables will convict churchgoers of sin or make them want to repent. Man-made, like human thoughts, talks developed around someone's opinion to give encouragement to a congregation. Those things will not convict anybody of sin, nor lead them to repentance. And the result, Wearsby says then, is a congregation of comfortable professing Christians listening to comfortable religious talk that often contains no true biblical doctrine. End quote. The reality is that there are many preachers and teachers who give the people what they want to hear. They tickle their ears, their itching ears. And some of those preachers and teachers want to tickle their own itching ears as well. They turn away from the truth. They turn to concepts devised by people instead of those devised by God. John MacArthur wrote this, quote, Many churches today are filled to overflowing with those who want their ears tickled with the myths of Christianity without obedience to the Word and the many variations of focusing on self-worth and so-called positive thinking. They, have, they come to have their egos, they come to church to have their egos fed and their sins approved, not to have their hearts cleansed and their souls saved. They want to only feel good, not to be made good. And tragically, such myths serve to religiously insulate people from the true gospel and drive them even further from the Lord. End quote. Personally, I certainly believe that there are some people in churches that don't do a real good job of preaching the word that, that truly are saved by faith in Jesus, but they're, they're going to struggle to grow. In, in a church that is not where the word is not being preached. And they'll often even not be living then the way that they should live according to the word of God. But I believe there sadly are many who sit in such churches who are not even saved. It is a horribly sad deception that they are under, always has been, since I've become a preacher, one of the 
saddest things for me to see countless people who think that they're in good shape because they come to church a certain amount. Essentially because they belong to a church or they have their butts in a pew a certain amount. It's a sad deception. Let's look at verse 5. He says, but, after talking about these folks that want, have the itching ears and they want their itching ears scratched, he says, but you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry, as he wrote again initially to Timothy. And then it was also shared with Timothy's congregation and then began to be shared with Christians everywhere. Despite the ever-increasing resistance to truth, Timothy and all preachers, and actually all Christians, for that matter, we must keep our heads screwed on straight. We need to hold unswervingly to God's Word, the Bible. We need to even be willing to suffer. Endure hardship for Jesus, if necessary. <coughs> And we all need to do the work of an evangelist. We need to proclaim the good news about who? Jesus. Every time we have a chance, and we need to look for those chances. Now, real quickly, relative to the work of an evangelist, let's not be confused. Yes, there are some people who are given a spiritual gift of evangelism. They, they are given by God, gifted through the Holy Spirit, to be specially good at sharing Jesus with people. And getting people's attention and you know being able to do that kind of thing. But understand, the Bible calls for all of us who are saved by faith in Jesus to be telling other people about Jesus. There are only so many evangelists. There are only so many preachers. The bulk, the bulk of the people, the believing people in the world are not in those positions. If it was only up to those few who are gifted with the gift of evangelism there wouldn't be much evangelism being done in the big scheme of things. No, it's like the gift of giving. The Bible says actually that there are people who are gifted by the Holy Spirit with the gift of giving of their finances. They have this special gift that they are just enabled to be so gracious and generous in giving of their finances. But does that excuse the rest of us from not giving? No, we're all called to give of our finances and actually to do it sacrificially. But there are certain ones who are especially gifted to do it especially well. Yet we're all called to do it. Same deal with evangelism. There are some people who are especially gifted by the Holy Spirit to evangelize. But the Bible says we're all called to do it. And the fact of the matter is that the all of us, the, 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 the bulk of us who represent Christianity, who, are, who have true saving faith in Jesus, we are far more greater than those who are gifted with the gift of evangelism. And so we can all make, those of us who don't have the gift of evangelism, we can make a huge impact if we follow, out, follow through with our responsibilities of exercising the duties of evangelism. Now I'm going to start with verse 6 here, and I'm going to tell you right now, next week i got a lot of work to do on it, but I'm going, to, I'm going to basically preach a sermon next week on verses 6, 7, and 8 here. We're finishing up with 2 Timothy today, but I found something that i got to develop a sermon around. He, he was a preacher, a Scottish preacher in the 1800s, and I found this sermon of his entitled, A Prisoner's Dying Thoughts. And it might be another tear-filled tear week, but... Um, and it's a long sermon, man. You think I preach long. You know, I see what some of these guys, their manuscripts for their sermons. Um, I'm going to try to... Uh, and, and some of his language, of course, is you know, Scottish and, and so forth. And so I'm going to try to boil that all down into a sermon for next week. It's basically going to be based on these next three verses here. But, so let's start with verse 6. Paul said, had all this stuff he had said so far, and he said... He's starting to wrap things up here with this, this last Holy Spirit-inspired communication from, from him. He said, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. And that departure wasn't the next flight to Antioch. Paul was going to die soon, and he knew it. He knew he wasn't getting out of that jail, that dungeon. 
The strong urgings of the previous verses take on now a lot of added weight. They were to be, again, His final Holy Spirit-inspired words to Timothy, Timothy's congregation, and to Christians ever since. The passionate preacher Paul was facing the end. It was his final chance to make an impact on lives in this mortal world. Timothy and others needed to keep on keeping on. Someone needed to step up and replace he who was going to depart this world in death. And I tell you, somewhere now, somewhere now in the world, there's a Paul that's dying. Who is going to replace him? Who will step up their game? Their Christian walk in this, in this short life and fill that void that that person's death will create. Who will that be? Could it be one of you? As I get older, other spiritual leaders here in church get older, who's going to replace us? Could it be one of you? Should it be one of you? Paul mentioned that he was like a drink offering being poured out. A drink offering was the pouring out of wine on the altar that was done with the daily sacrifice of lambs under the Mosaic Law. You can read about it in Numbers 28. It symbolized devotion and commitment to God. It carried with it the ultimate association of pouring out of blood. Completely giving over and sacrificing one's life to God. Completely giving over and sacrificing one's life for God. We are to give our lives to God as a living sacrifice. I quoted that a million times. Remember what book it's in least, at least? Yep, I'm going to keep saying it because obviously I'm not saying it enough. It's Romans 12.1. I quote that one all the time. We are to give our lives to God as a living sacrifice. The sacrifices we make to God, we don't slay animals and, and burn offerings and so forth. The sacrifice He requires is our life to Him, given to Him, sacrificed for Him. Paul had done so and he faced death with hope, with peace. George Whitefield, the fiery preacher of the 1700s, said this from his deathbed, I go to my everlasting rest. My sun has risen, shone, and it's setting. But no, it's about to rise and shine forever. I have not lived in vain. And though I could live to preach Christ 1,000 years, I die to be with Him, which is far better. That was his deathbed statement. Verse 7. He said, I have fought the good fight. Guess the tears aren't over. I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We need to finish this life that we've been called to live in for Jesus. We need to finish it, and we need to finish it well. Some of you who are old enough, there was a boxer named Roberto Duran. He had a, several, it might have even been three different fights with Sugar Ray Leonard, and he infamously, in the last fight, he just quit. He just said, no mass. He just quit, gave up. It's not to be that way. And if you've ever seen the video of an Olympic runner from a number of years ago now, He'd already came back from an injury from the previous Olympics, recovered from that, trained for the new Olympics, started out on his run and tore a hamstring. And he hobbled his way. He finished that race. Obviously finished last in great pain. That was one, if you ever saw the video, his dad actually ran down out of the stands and ran along with him. We need to fight the good fight to the end. J.C. Ryle wrote this, Let us settle in our minds that the Christian fight is a good fight, a really good fight, truly good, emphatically good fight. We only see part of it now. We see the struggle, but not the end. We see the campaign, but not the reward. We see the cross, but not the crown. We see a few humble, broken-spirited, 
penitent praying people enduring hardships and despised by the world, but we see not the hand of God over them. The face of God smiling on them. The kingdom of glory prepared for them. These things are yet to be revealed, but let us not judge by appearances. There are more good things about the Christian warfare than what we can see. End quote. Brothers and sisters, we need to fight the good fight and we need to keep the faith until the end. We need to finish our race. We need to stay true to living the Christian life and following the Word of God, learning it and following it, doing it. Until God calls us home. There was a guy named Henry Martin. He gave up all to go to India. He served in India and translated the New Testament into three different Indian language dialects. He died at the age of 31. Doing all we can and giving up everything for God doesn't mean we're going to live a long life. Before he died, he wrote this. And when I am dying, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has been blazed out for thee. I shall not care whatever I gave of labor, of money, one sinner to save. I shall not care that the way has been rough, that thy dear feet led the way for me is enough. And when I am dying, how glad I shall be. That the lamp of my life has been blazed out for thee. Verse 8. Paul said, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. All of us with true saving faith in Jesus can look forward with great anticipation to the day our Lord Jesus Christ awards us with the crown of righteousness. That crown of righteousness He will eventually give us is His sinless perfection. The complete righteousness of Jesus. That will be our victor's crown. The Greek word was stephanos. It was used of the athlete's victory laurel. The, that laurel of leaves that you maybe saw, see in old pictures back in those days that the athletes were given. Imagine that we will one day be sinless. Without sin at all. Finally and completely transformed and conformed to the image of Jesus. Verse 8 says that will happen on that day. When's that day? Some people think it'll be the moment that we depart this world in death. That Paul referred to his imminent departure as being that day. Others believe it will be at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, when Jesus will give varying rewards to people. But my problem with that is those rewards will be based on what we did with our salvation. And we don't receive righteousness because of what we did. So I really don't think that's it. Still others see that day being the rapture, the moment, the moment that we receive our glorified immortal bodies. Again, it seems to me that the crown of righteousness which we will receive is in fact the perfect righteousness of Jesus. I can't imagine that we, again, we go from this life and we die, it says we will be with the Lord in heaven. I can't imagine that we'll be there still as a sinful person. I think we will be there as, as a completely perfect righteous person. And so I think it has to be when we die we, and we go to be with Him, we will receive our righteousness. In any case, whenever that day is, all true believers will receive our victor's crown. That crown right now is securely stored in heaven, protected by God Himself until that day. What a great hope that is. We should long 
for the appearing of Jesus. Verses 9 through 12. Paul says, Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. So in verse 9 and again in verse 21, Paul urged Timothy to come to Rome quickly. Think again, Paul knew he didn't have much time left. The delivery of this letter to Timothy and then Timothy traveling the whole way from Ephesus to Rome <clears throat> would actually take months. Paul could easily be executed before Timothy got there and the truth is we, he may have been. We don't know. We don't actually know if Timothy ever got there before Paul died or not. Demas was previously mentioned by Paul as a fellow worker of the Lord in Colossians chapter 4 and in Philemon, the book of Philemon. But he deserted Paul for the safety, freedom, and comfort of Thessalonica. For whatever it's worth, I don't believe, as some do, that that means Demas wasn't saved, that he wasn't even a true believer. I think in the face of trouble and danger, he chose personal safety. I think he chose his personal comfort over being with Paul. And I think before we're too critical about Demas, I think we should think of the times that we have failed to stand up for Jesus or even stand up for a fellow Christian who was being made fun of or whatever, especially when the worst we would have faced was also just being made fun of. Nothing is known of the guy named Cretans that's mentioned here. He and Titus, and of course we know about Titus, he wrote the New Testament book of Titus, um, they were both apparently sent to minister in the regions of Galatia and Dalmatia. They, uh, I say that they were apparently sent there to serve, not that they fled there to, to avoid being associated with Paul in his imprisonment. Luke was still with Paul. He had been with him during his first imprisonment in the house of Rast in Rome. Timothy was to bring Mark, that's John Mark, the cousin of um, Barnabas, when he came to Rome, John, Mark, and Barnabas, of course, had started out with Paul on a missionary journey, but then what did, what did John Mark do? Yeah, in the early part of the journey, he decided that wasn't for him, and he, he abandoned him and went back home, and Paul and Silas actually ended up, or Paul and Barnabas ended up with a, in a disagreement with that, over that pretty severely, and actually went on two different journeys. But by now, John Mark must have proven himself because Paul says here that he was helpful to him. Tychicus had been sent to Ephesus. He may have carried this particular letter to Timothy in Ephesus. He had previously delivered letters of Ephesians and Colossians. Paul might have also, some think Paul might have also asked Tychicus to fill in for Timothy as the pastor of the church in Ephesus while Timothy left there and came to Paul. But it's just speculation. Verses 13 through 15. He says, When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and bring my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. Well, little is known about this Carpus guy that's mentioned here. They don't really know too much about him. The scrolls and parchments that Paul referred to that he wanted Timothy to bring him probably were Old Testament scriptures, but we can't be sure. And pretty obvious, Paul likely needed, wanted his cloak brought, brought to him because with winter approaching and in a dungeon cell, uh, he was going to need that to stay warm until, again, he met his death. This Alexander may be the one who Paul handed over to Satan, as mentioned in 1 Timothy 1, but it seems that that Alexander was a believer, and it seems like this Alexander the metal worker was not. And in fact, this Alexander the metal worker it seems like he maybe played a big role in having Paul imprisoned this time that would result in his death. So Paul said, the Lord will repay him for what he's done, but he, he warned Timothy, you watch out for him too. So apparently he was a threat to other Christian leaders at that time. Verses 16 through 18. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength 
so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely where? To His heavenly kingdom. Understand, that's our ultimate rescue. Not an earthly one. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. This first defense that Paul mentions here in these closing comments apparently was maybe some kind of a preliminary hearing there at the start of this imprisonment. His first imprisonment in, in Rome that we read, read about in the book of Acts, that was, again, a house arrest type of deal where people were free to come and go and visit him and there was no real pressures or consequences of association with Paul at that time, but things had changed a lot by the time Paul was imprisoned in Rome the second time. Many Christians had been tortured, killed under Emperor Nero. This time Paul was imprisoned in a dungeon, not in a house. And there was no doubt a great danger just to even be associated with him, that you might end up in the same position as him. At his preliminary hearing, apparently Luke hadn't arrived in Rome yet because Paul said there was nobody there with him. And none of those who were in Rome came to stand with him. None of them came to support him. But Paul was understanding about their fear and he expressed hope that it wouldn't be held against them. Certainly, including Timothy, wouldn't hold it against them for not coming to be with Paul when he was going through that. He said, although he was alone, God gave him the strength and the courage to present the gospel there in the Roman court of judgment. Understand that that's what he was talking about here when he was in that preliminary hearing. Here's this little Jewish guy, chained, defenseless, alone, friendless, standing in the imperial Roman court. And in the midst of all the power and prestige of the Roman court, Paul preached the good news of Jesus which was the whole reason that he was there and in prison and soon to die. Paul knew his death was coming, but he noted that at that preliminary hearing, he easily could have been killed there or right after that. But God once again preserved his life for a period. He still wasn't done with him. But now with his death nearing, Paul claimed the ultimate deliverance from evil, that again, all of us can claim that even in death, God delivers us from evil for He brings us to His heavenly kingdom. In earthly death, the Christian actually experiences the ultimate victory. That is the reality. I get the sadness of death as much as anybody else. But we do need to understand that actually our earthly death will be our ultimate victory because we will forevermore be in the presence of God Himself and we will be sinless and we will never suffer all the stuff that we suffer in this life, however good it often is. It's filled with sorrows and pains and struggles. And one day we will be delivered from all of that. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. To Him be glory truly forever and ever. Amen. Verses 19 and 20. Greet Priscilla and Aquila in the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Priscilla and Aquila were the well-known couple who taught Apollos in Ephesus, as recorded in Acts chapter 18, Romans chapter 16, and 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul had called them fellow workers in Christ Jesus and said that they risked their lives for me in Romans chapter 16. Paul praised Onesiphorus, if you remember earlier in 2 Timothy in chapter 1, he had had kind words, good words to say about Onesiphorus. Erastus was an old fellow worker with Timothy. Read about him in Acts chapter 19. And Trophimus was from Ephesus. Read in Acts 20 and 21 about Trophimus. Timothy likely knew him. And we should note here that though Paul had healed, you know, the Holy Spirit enabled Paul to heal some people and even raised Eutychus from the dead and so forth, 
Paul left Trophimus what? Sick in Miletus. And so, again, it's a picture of that even the, even the early church signs and wonders healings were not just a power that somebody was given to use whenever they wanted. And Paul left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Verse 21 says, Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters there in Rome. Again, if Timothy didn't get there before winter set in, he probably wouldn't be able to get there till after winter because of the sailing conditions. Again, there was no flight from Ephesus to Rome. It was only by, by ship over the Aegean Sea. And if you didn't make that trip before winter set in, you were likely weren't going to be able to make it till spring. And so Paul's pleading with Timothy, try to get here before winter. It might have also been that, of course, cloak, he, Paul needed that cloak. He didn't want to be freezing all winter in that dungeon cell. And certainly I don't think the least of this is that Paul might have figured if he doesn't get here by winter and he has to wait till spring, I'm probably going to be dead by then. Very well could have been that. And he really wanted to see Timothy. We don't really know anything of... It. He mentions Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia. They were believers in Rome who Timothy must have known because he mentioned them. Paul mentioned them specifically. But then Paul also said all the believers in Rome send their greetings to the church in Ephesus. You can see Paul's forgiving spirit and his, his willingness to send greetings from these people who remember they were believers in Rome, but when he was at his preliminary hearing, none of them came to support him because they were afraid they would get arrested for even being there with him. But Paul didn't hold that against them and sent greetings from all of them to Timothy. Verse 22 says, The Lord be with your spirit and grace be with you all. Now many commentators will point out something that we can't see in the English translation. The word your in that, in that verse, the Lord be with your spirit. That's singular in the Greek. Meaning, he was referring specifically to Timothy, the Lord be with your sp spirit. But then when it says grace be with you all, that you is plural in the Greek. And so it's another example of how this Paul intended this letter to be read to all the church members there in Ephesus and then eventually it got shared with other Christians and still to us today here we see these final words of final Holy Spirit word, inspired words of, of Paul and we can understand certainly that his greeting to us would have been or his departing comment to us would be grace, grace be with you all. There was a guy named Bill Broadhurst when he was 18, he had an aneurysm in his brain. It left uh, the left side of his body partially paralyzed. In 10 years, by the time he was 28, he was able to walk with the use of a cane. And he was still hampered by a, kind of a stiff-legged limp, it's described as. But he, he returned to trying to run. He had been a runner. And for 10 years, he hadn't... He had trouble even walking, and he still had some trouble, but apparently he, with a hobbled kind of a, of a gait, he, would try to, he, he returned to running some. And he entered a 6.2-mile running race in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, I actually, believe it or not, used to run uh, some races like that. They were 6.2 miles is a 10K, 10 kilometers. And um, I think the last one I ran was in Tyrone, I believe, but that was a long time ago. That won't be happening anymore. So he entered this race, and as the starting gun sounded, famous marathoner Bill Rogers was at that race. Some of you, again, maybe especially older ones, would remember Bill Rogers, famous marathoner. He, he was in the race. He quickly took the lead. Bill Broadhurst quickly fell far behind. Bill Rogers won the race. He covered the distance in less than 30 minutes, 6.2 miles in 30 minutes. Uh, now, now, I never approached that when I was running it. Other professional runners were not far behind, and joggers and weekend runners finished the race in an hour or so. The stragglers finished in two hours. After two hours and 20 minutes, Bill Broadhurst is still trying to get there. There was no one in sight. 
His left side felt numb. A child, seeing him struggling alone by himself, yelled out to him, Hey, mister, the race is over. You missed it. Broadhurst's body screamed with pain, but he kept going. He wanted to finish the race. Two hours and 30 minutes after the starting gun, the sky was darkening, the police were gone, there were no crowds left in the street. Broadhurst's limp worsened and his left leg was almost dragging as he hobbled along, pushing himself toward the end. He began to wonder if it was really all worth the effort. Everything hurt. Finally, he saw the ending point of the race, but as he hob hobbled along, he saw that they didn't even have the finish banner, the, 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 the banner, you know, that you always cross through to end a race. They, they had taken it down and packed it away already for, the, for next year's race. There was nobody around. The place was deserted. His heart sank as he realized how far behind he was. How long ago the race had ended and on the dark street with no one watching, what difference would it make if he crossed that imaginary finish line? But he did. This will be tough. As he crossed the finish line, from out of the alleyway stepped Bill Rogers, the famous marathoner, who was, by the way, had always been Bill Broadhurst's hero. Bill Rogers was hiding in the alley with a couple other people, a small group of people. And as Bill Broadhurst stumbled across the finish line, Bill Broadhurst was welcomed by his hero with open arms as Bill Rogers embraced him and the small group with him cheered. And taking the gold medal that Bill Rogers had won from the race off of his neck, he put it on Broadhurst's neck and declared him the winner. It was a moment of victory more electric than the two hours earlier when the crowd had cheered Bill Rogers across the finish line. It's more than just a <clears throat> storing personal, personal situation. We should be able to relate to it because all of us with true saving faith have a great hope. Soon after the struggles and weariness of this life, we will also cross the finish line and we will meet our hero, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we step across the finish line, He will step out, not from the shadows, but from the blaze of His own glory. And He will give us the gold medal, the victor's laurel, laurel wreath, the crown of His own righteousness. For He has run the race before us, and He has done so perfectly. Well done, good and faithful servant, He will say to those who endure to the end. I heard an old, old story about a Savior who came from glory. How He gave His life on Calvary to, to save a wretch like me. I heard about His groaning. I heard about His precious blood's atoning power. And then I repented of my sins and I, I won the victory. And I heard about His healing and I, I heard about His cleansing power revealing. I heard about how He made the, the lame to walk and, and He caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow, Jesus came and brought to me the victory. And I heard about a mansion that He's built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold that's out there beyond the crystal sea. And all about all the angels singing. About that old redemption story that has been told for so many years. 
And some sweet day, I'll sing up there the song of victory. Victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. He sought me out, and He bought me with His redeeming blood. And He loved me before I ever knew Him. So all my love is due Him. Because He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood of His sacrificial blood. I pray that you have that victory that Bill Broadhurst has that was so beautifully pictured by what Bill Rogers did for him, but we have an even far greater, an infinitely greater hero awaiting for us to stumble across that finish line. And boy, if you're like me, it's, sometimes it really is a stumble in this journey. But when I stumble across that line, my hero is going to be there with open arms because He gives me the victory and He will give me my crown, His righteousness. An unimaginable thought. The closing hymn is 353, Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Please stand as we sing.